Thank you. In 2007, I departed here in Miami to not only break a record, but shatter a record, where I'm currently the Guinness World Record holder for being the youngest person to fly solo around the world. <laughs> youngest person before me was 37 years of age. I had the opportunity to accomplish this at just 23 years of age. Of course, in partnership with over 40 sponsors here in Miami. But where did this all start for me? You see, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, moved here to Miami at the age of six from very humble beginnings. I was a high school football star at Miami Northwestern Senior High, 197 pounds, 3% body fat, ran a 4-3 and a 40, and a lot of girls wore my, my jersey number on their shirts. <laughs> my life changed one day when I met an airline pilot named Captain Gary Robinson. He walked into a store, dressed in his pilot's uniform, and said to me, hey son, have you ever thought about becoming a pilot? I looked at him crazy and asked him two questions. The first question I asked was, how smart do you have to be to become a pilot? <laughs> the second question I asked was, how much money do you make as a pilot? <laughs> After he answered the second question, interest turned into passion, and I pursued a career of becoming a pilot. <laughs> Little did I know the challenges I would have to overcome to even embark on such a journey. Now, you're looking at the slide and you're saying to yourself, well, how does a sub deodorant in an aircraft engine equal a $650,000 airplane? You see, for two and a half years, I had to wait until the first person told me, yes, I'm willing to sponsor you. And that was from Miami Executive Aviation. And even before I got to that point, I realized that I needed sponsors. So I said to myself one day, the same way you look at a car and you see the logo on the hood of the car doesn't mean that company made all the parts in the car. Well, that applies true in an airplane. So no one wanted to rent me a plane, lease me a plane, or let me borrow an aircraft. And I said to myself, I'm going to piece it together. I took it upon myself to drive 12 hours from Miami to Mobile, Alabama, with just enough money to rent a car, put gas in it, buy a 12-inch sub, six inches for the first half of the day, six inches for the second half of the day, I kid you not, didn't get oil and vinegar, didn't want to be too soggy at the second half of the day. <laughs> I'm just being real. Brought plenty of deodorant with me. Why? Because I couldn't afford to stay in a hotel or a motel. And I showed up at one of the largest engine manufacturers in the world, and I said, hi, my name is Barrington Irving. I want to see if your engine is good enough for my airplane. I didn't even own an airplane, but it got me through the door. So I get to the door and I'm taking the tour and everything of, of the engine and, and why I should utilize their engine. And I did some homework and I studied who the CEO of the company was. And I called him by his first name and I said, is Brian here? They said, oh, you know Brian? Yeah, yeah, I know Brian. I met Brian a couple times at air shows and conventions and so forth. Never met the guy in my life. Got a phone call a couple weeks later. It was Brian. And Brian said, you know, normally we don't sponsor engines for something that's dangerous, but if you had the guts to find me, I believe you can find yourself around the world. Brian donated an engine worth $83,000 right there on the spot. After that, I was able to get the cockpit system donated for $70,000, the seats and so forth, cut the cost of the $650,000 airplane in half, financed the rest of it, and flew out of Oregon at the age of 21 with the $650,000 airplane. Now, we see another formula. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm big in science, technology, engineering, and math. All right, so we have an equation here. $30 plus you can't swim, no radar, and it equals the world. Well, one of the funniest things happened to me the day that I departed out of here in Miami. You see, there was about 5,000 people at the airport. CNN was there, Today Show was there. Everyone was interviewing me. But unbeknownst to anyone, do you know how much money I had to fly around the world the day I left Miami? I had three $10 bills in my pocket. 
And it was, it was hilarious to me because I would look at all these signs that people made, go Barrington, go, go Barrington, go, and I'll say to myself, where the hell am I going? I only have $30 in my pocket. <laughs> in addition to that, people did not know that I couldn't swim. And I figured, what did it matter? If I crashed in the Atlantic, no one would be able to get me anyway. I didn't have any support. In addition to that, I had no weather radar, no de-icing, flying in and out of storms, playing a guessing game. But I was able to fly around the world, a journey that took 97 days, 145 flight hours. Imagine sitting the way you're sitting for 12 and a half hours at a time, flying to different destinations and countries. I flew through a sandstorm, I flew through a sandstorm over Saudi Arabia at 17,000 feet, incurred icing, got caught in a monsoon over Vietnam, where my aircraft literally went from 20,000 feet flying through a monsoon over the mountains at 9,100 feet. And within the blink of an eye, my airplane, due to a downdraft, descended from 20,000 feet to 9,200 feet. Now, two things happened in that moment. <laughs> the first thing that happened was, of course, I did the right thing. I added full power, was able to, to climb out. The second thing that happened in that moment was that I needed an extra set of underwear. <laughs> After flying around the world and becoming the Guinness record holder for being the youngest person to accomplish this feat, I realized something even more important. My Foundation Experience Aviation, which we launched here in Miami, serviced thousands of kids whether through career fairs, mentorships, building rockets. As a matter of fact, we did a program called Build and Soar, in partnership where Miami Executive allowed us to use their hangar, and in partnership with George T. Baker Aviation High School, where we took 60 kids from failing schools here in Miami, brought them together to build a flyable aircraft from scratch. And that is a process to see from the background. Because it's not a good thing to hear a 13-year-old or a 16-year-old or 18-year-old say, uh-oh, we made a mistake here. We have something to correct. Not only did they build the aircraft, but I put my life on the line and flew it on its first flight, which was a success. <laughs> I'm here to talk about <laughs> For some of those kids, that was the first thing they ever accomplished in their lives. I couldn't understand that. That caused me to wonder, what else more can I do? Then I started to do some studies, and I read an article in Fortune magazine about a year and a half ago that changed my life. In the USA, of 4.2 million high school kids, only 2.9 million are graduating school. Out of the 2.9 million, only 277,550 are actually pursuing a career in science, technology, engineering, and math. I said, oh my gosh, we're screwed. <laughs> then I had to study, well, what's, what, how, what, is, what has taken our young people away? What has their attention? So in studying that, I realized real quickly, 46 million of kids between the ages of 5 and 17 play video games. You want to know how much the average amount of hours kids spend on media in a day? 10 hours. In addition to that, 1.6, look at this, 1.6% is the amount education invests in technology compared to 67% the private sector invests. Now, I know we have adults here in the audience who say, well, we don't play games. Well, guess what? I have something to share with you. 1.3 billion adults participate in rewards and membership programs here in the United States. What's the objective of the game? To get as much points as you can in order to buy this thing or that thing or whatever the case may be. Then I ask myself a question. How do we give one million kids the world? Hmm, it's a tough question. Then I said to myself, how do we impact academic performance in math and science? That's when, just recently, I decided to partner with Miami Executive Aviation and the third largest aircraft manufacturer in the world, 
known as Embraer, to create a flying classroom. We are transforming a jet into a flying classroom, and we'll be able to broadcast live video feeds, host forums, do multiple educational lessons from 40,000 feet in the air. Now let's go back to that one million. How am I going to impact one million kids in the first year this thing takes off? Well, we've already began to establish partnerships with entities such as NASA, Teach for America, United Nations Foundation, and others that we're lining up behind us because they see if you're able to travel around the world and show kids the relevance of math and science, you now have a motivated student whose interest you just piqued. Interest opens the door for learning. This is, just, this is not just an aircraft. This is an exploration vehicle for learning. And now we'll have that opportunity to teach kids in a way that's never been done before from 40,000 feet in the air. But then I didn't want to just stop there. I look back at my experience with games, my own personal experience. And I remember when I couldn't afford to fly airplanes after being introduced to it by my mentor. You know what saved me? I went out and purchased a $40 game called Microsoft Flight Simulator. That game kept my interest for the next three years of my life when I made that critical decision to turn down top football scholarships to pursue a career in aviation from that one game. And I said to myself, you know what? I want to create a game where kids will be able to be placed in simulated real world situations and they have to use math and science in order to figure it out and solve the problem. Well, what do you mean by that? One of the projects we're currently exploring is recreating the devastation which occurred in Haiti and creating a game where students have to decide, well, what kind of aircraft will I have to dispatch based on math, based on science? Is the runway long enough? Is this the right aircraft that I will have to utilize for this mission? Well, I have to deliver medical supplies in X amount of time. Make math real and make math relevant. You know, a couple months ago, I went through an experience and I thank my beautiful wife, you know, who provided me the opportunity to have twin girls who entered this world. They were brought into this world at only six months. And I'll never forget that moment. Because for the 10 weeks they were in the hospital after, after the C-section and so forth, and we had to drive back and forth every day, I'll never forget how I looked at my daughters and I said to myself, I wanted to give them the world. But I was helpless. I wasn't able to do that. And then I looked around at all the nurses and doctors and so forth, and I saw how they created the world of opportunity for my very own kids. Ladies and gentlemen, each one of us may not be able to give kids the world on our own, but in partnerships and collaborations, we're able to give them a world of opportunity in science, technology, engineering, and math. Thank you guys for having me.